It was great. It was like pheasant season in South Dakota. If it moved, oh, you shot it. That's not a pheasant. We're not in South Dakota. What's wrong with this picture? And they say, where you from? Where you at? Turn around. Turn around. I say, hold on. I live right here in the next block. Turn around. Common Ground Relief Board. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I think there just must have been some confusion. I don't about know. That's what I'm trying to, trying, yeah, trying, trying to find out. Yeah. Well, we talked to somebody from ICE yesterday. I see me. ICE don't run the shit. People that could help are at war right now, fighting another way, and they, they, they've given them permission to go down and shoot us. And subtle, but in even many ways more profoundly devastating, is the lasting damage to the survivors' will to rebuild and remain in the area. The destruction of the spirit of the people of southern Louisiana and Mississippi may end up being the most tragic loss of all. George Bush doesn't care about black people. March of 1927, the Mississippi River, the largest river in the United States, stretching some 2.3 thousand miles from Minnesota to New Orleans, began to flood. Like the Nile, the Mississippi River is prone to seasonal flooding, but this year it overwhelmed the residents who lived on its banks, especially in the south, where the river dumps most of its water into the Mississippi Delta. 637,000 lost their homes, 550,000 of them were black. This tragedy was not entirely an act of God, however. Wealthy whites in New Orleans, fearing for the safety of their city, decided that in order for New Orleans to be protected, there would be a sacrifice. The howling storm god that was the Mississippi demanded that satisfaction, and they would pay it in full. Governor Oramel Simpson, goaded on by the wealthiest citizens of New Orleans, decided to bomb the levees in order to allow flooding to take Plaquemine and St. Bernard Parish instead both of which had significant black populations. Fifty men, only six of whom actually elected officials, signed the death warrants of hundreds of thousands of black people, as well as other minorities affected by the ensuing Noachian destruction. The citizens of St. Bernard Parish tried and failed to prevent this, patrolling the levees and even taking shots at then-President Hoover as he scouted the levees for a good place to bomb. Quote, Where do they get the authority to drown us out? to deprive us of our homes and our living. We had enough of it in 1922. We won't stand for it. We should die fighting for our rights. These efforts were in vain. While the rich watched the gruesome fireworks from their yachts, the poor, destitute, and now homeless residents of both parishes embarked on a long, arduous journey toward the refugee camps run by the Red Cross. In a situation horrifically similar to what we will soon see took place in New Orleans in 2005, Residents were crammed into ill-prepared and ill-stocked shelters to languish under the eye of a government that could hardly be bothered to care for them. Quote, The railroads and plantations affected by the flood feared their laborers, who lost everything when forced from their homes, would never return. In the Delta Lowlands, African-American families made up 75% of the population and supplied 95% of the agricultural labor force. Many of these laborers were trapped in situations far worse than sharecropping stuck in a system that bound them perpetually to plantations. To keep refugees nearby, the railroad and plantations partnered with the American Red Cross to create a system of refugee camps, steering more than 200,000 African Americans into them. The camps varied in size and also living conditions, ranging from acceptable to deplorable. The final report of the Colored Advisory Commission, appointed to cooperate with the American Red Cross and the President's Committee on Relief Work in the Mississippi Valley flood disaster of 1927, noted, the camps in which we found the most satisfactory conditions were those where the local colored people have had an opportunity to assist in the administration of affairs. The camps which were found to be especially good were Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and Natchez. In the camps at Greenville, Sicily Island, and Opelousas, the colored people had practically no part in the activities of the colored refugees. At many camps, including the one in Greenville, Mississippi, National Guard troops prevented refugees from leaving and outsiders from visiting. The Colored Advisory Commission reported that at Greenville, Negro inmates complained whites came and went at will, without passes, while colored people were not given similar privileges. There were also complaints of rough treatment of colored people 
and discrimination regarding labor conditions and the distribution of food. The Guard also unofficially promised to return refugees to their employers after the flood was over. Thousands of African Americans would later leave these refugee camps or bypass them altogether to pursue new lives in northern towns and cities, accelerating the Great Migration." End quote. The citizens of these parishes were written off. The state and the wealthy it served, when faced with the choice of possible but, as they were repeatedly informed, unlikely damage to their city, or the total destruction of poor, black, and minority homes, they chose the latter. The federal government and the president himself gave them a blank check to essentially condemn their fellow countrymen to die to protect their pocketbooks. In fact, this event was one of the factors that drove black people away from the Republican Party, but that's a digression. The people of Plaquemine and St. Bernard Parish were abandoned. This was no accident, but a deliberate, planned process. This process, and our topic for today, is called organized abandonment. Now, normally this is a corporate term. It describes a process by which a corporation may remove, sell off, or otherwise let die some of its assets in service of the greater organism's survival and profit. Management guru and philosopher and educator Peter Drucker coined the term in 1990 to describe the intentional ejection or removal of any aspect of an organization that no longer serves the whole. At the time, he was not thinking of it in the context of the state and climate change. In recent decades, however, various left thinkers have begun to explore the topic as it relates to the state. Author and abolitionist geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore is one of the main voices to have engaged in this topic. In several extended talks, she explained this topic as it relates to organizing and abolitionism, as well as climate change. Organized abandonment exploits inequality and deepens it. Now, abandonment itself seems self-explanatory. Individuals, households, communities, workers, entire industrial sectors, manufacturing, agricultural, and other capacities are cut loose and locked in or locked out. But I suggest that the organized part of organized abandonment is where maybe we should put our energy and focus. That organized part sharpens our awareness of how abandonment results from plans as well as abdications of responsibility, right? So it's not merely a withdrawal, but it's a plan. Organized helps us analyze why things happen by seeing how in order to identify possible contradictions to, uh, uh, to counter exploit in order to shift the ground of the future's historical geography, which is to say to shift what's happening before whatever comes after. Ruth defines organized abandonment as the process by which the state does a triage of its populations, deciding who does and does not get resources or receive help. In a sense, it is an expression of necropolitics, especially in the era of climate collapse. The suffix necro meaning death explains the definition of necropolitics, a politics of deciding who lives and who dies and how through the use of social and political power, the restriction of vaccines to third world countries, the use of their bodies in the third world to test those vaccines was an expression of necropolitics. It was organized abandonment. Through organized abandonment, the state dictates and decides who lives and who dies as it dictates where resources are and are not directed. Quote, Thinking about organized abandonment should bring us to consider how capital, large and small, and the state, municipal or greater, work together to raise barriers to some kinds of people and lower them to others. Organized abandonment produces the experience of having been forgotten or left out. End quote. Right now, Israel is depriving Gaza of water, light, food, and any form of peaceful political advocacy. The Israeli policy toward Palestine is a necropolitic. The only political action Palestinians are granted by the Israeli state at this moment is to die. The abandonment of Palestinians by the world has been a long systemic process and an intentional one with further economic goals. The most familiar form of organized abandonment to this audience would be what we call austerity or the state pulling back resources it provides and privatizing them to cover for budgetary overtures and prevent the government from running out of money. As things like healthcare, water, power, food, and housing are locked behind monetary barriers, those who cannot afford them are intentionally left behind. We're all familiar with the phrase, the cruelty is the point. In a sense, the entire neoliberal era has been defined, at least in America, by the slow organized abandonment of the American people to the whims of capital and the unfolding climate catastrophe it has caused. As the ongoing climate crisis unfolds, 
as maintaining control and profit becomes more difficult in some areas, we will begin to see the process of abandonment unfold before our eyes. In fact, it already has begun. Understanding the various expressions of system failure as instead intentional choices and issues of planning gives us an immediate answer to why our communities suffer as they do. Nothing is over or underfunded, but the values and intentions of the system and those running it are made bare. The lack of water in Flint, the poisoning of aquifers in Hawaii, the destruction of green spaces in lower income neighborhoods, and positioning of them near factories and freeways that expose them to worse air quality and pollution and make them less resilient to flooding in favor of gentrifying development. These are forms of abandonment. Someone's being left behind to make it possible. Someone else suffers to make it possible. In this work, we are exploring organized abandonment as it relates to both the state and to climate collapse, but also exploring what resistance under these unfolding conditions looks like, what it must do, and where it has already been done. But to discuss that, we will have to look back two decades to discuss a different climate disaster. So let me tell you a story. Um, the winds have really picked up here significantly over the last half hour or so. Uh, it feels to me that, that this may be for us the worst part of the storm, or at least over the next hour, this may be the worst for us. Uh, it, uh, but it is blowing the rain just completely horizontally. You cannot even look in a, in a northward direction. Visibility is down. Uh, it, it's hard to got it. It's hard to even tell. Mid-August 2005, a small bundle of clouds begin swirling together as they hover over the Atlantic. Warm waters goad the slowly forming storm on until Tuesday, August 23, 2005, a tropical depression forms. By the 25th, she has a name, Katrina. The now Category 2 hurricane with winds over 90 miles per hour hit the Florida coast a few miles north of Miami at Keating Beach. The flooding killed a few dozen people, but it wasn't a very destructive storm. The expectation was that the small hurricane would hit land, move north, and die out quickly. The actual reality was that the storm would cause destruction from the Louisiana coast to Canada. Katrina unexpectedly headed west, swinging back out to sea and hitting the warm waters of the Gulf Coast. Just a day later on the 27th, she became a Category 3 as she roared toward the Mississippi-Louisiana coast. On the 26th, then-governor of Louisiana and howling racist Kathleen Blanco would declare a state of emergency and Mayor Nagin of New Orleans follows suit. He orders voluntary evacuations of New Orleans as the city braces for the storm. The Superdome, a massive stadium in the heart of New Orleans, is prepped for 1,500 people to have food and water for three days. The next day, the 28th, evacuations become mandatory, and 20,000 people, unable to leave due to lacking transportation, money for a way out, or other reasons, are forced to enter the Superdome. Katrina is now a Category 4, and shows no signs of slowing down its buildup as it prepares to annihilate the Gulf Coast. The state is not lacking in means to move these people. 1.2 million manage to leave the city as contraflow plans are activated, and tolls are suspended to speed up the process. Hundreds of school buses, commandeered to move those who can't transport themselves, sit unused in a parking lot to be rendered worthless by floodwaters in just 24 hours. The manpower to drive them exists, Blanco has the ability to issue orders that would temporarily allow anyone with a license to drive the buses, but she doesn't, and enough properly licensed drivers can't be found. One third of New Orleans Police Department abandons the city and the people they claim to protect and serve. Meanwhile, the state rushes to prepare the levees for what will be nightmarish conditions. The levees are barely meant to withstand a Category 2 hurricane. In some places, the levees are considerably damaged and in need of repair. In others, they aren't even finished being constructed. The levee is essentially held together with sandbags and willpower. These weakened sections make it such that the completed sections are basically useless. Sections of the levee were constructed piecemeal due to different state and local government agencies being responsible for different parts and not coordinating with each other effectively, and only receiving funding project by project rather than a consistent general budget for levee maintenance. Another issue is that the city of New Orleans is sinking. When the city was built, it was built on swampland and marshes that had to be drained of water. This caused the land to begin a process of subsistence, where the land settles and sinks. New Orleans is thus six feet below sea level and sinking at a rate of 0.3 inches per year. When the levees were built, this was not accounted for, so even where the levees function, they are shorter than they need to be. The initial storm surges of Katrina at nine feet easily overtop the levees when they arrive and destroy the damaged sections. Katrina will bring surges of up to 20 feet. Quote, 
The risk to New Orleanians, i.e. the probability of failure combined with the consequences to human health and safety if that failure were to occur, was much higher than many people are generally willing to accept. Because these risks were not well understood or communicated effectively to the public, the importance of evacuating people and protecting property was underestimated. The hurricane protection system was constructed as individual pieces, not as an interconnected system, with strong portions built adjacent to weak portions, some pump stations that could not withstand the hurricane forces, and many penetrations through the levees for roads, railroads, and utilities. Furthermore, the levees were not designed to withstand overtopping. The hurricane protection system was designed for meteorological conditions, barometric pressure and wind speed, for example, that were not as severe as the Weather Bureau and National Weather Service listed as being characteristic of a major Gulf Coast hurricane. Levee builders used an incorrect datum to measure levee elevations, resulting in many levees not being built high enough. Some levees were built one to two feet lower than the intended design elevation. Furthermore, despite the acknowledged fact that New Orleans is subsiding, no measures were taken into account in the design to compensate for the subsistence by monitoring the levees and raising them up to the pre-subsistence design elevation. No single agency was in charge of hurricane protection in New Orleans. Rather, responsibility for the maintenance and operation of the levees and pump stations was spread over many federal, state, parish, and local agencies. This lack of interagency coordination led to many adverse consequences for Hurricane Katrina. The hurricane projection system was funded on a project-by-project -project basis over many years. As a result, the system was constructed in a piecemeal fashion. In addition, there were pressures for trade-offs and low-cost solutions that compromised quality, safety, and reliability. The design of the New Orleans hurricane protection system was not subject to the rigorous external review by senior experts that is often conducted for similar life safety structures and systems. Fifty breaches would occur in the levees over the course of the storm. By 7 o'clock a.m. Sunday morning, the 28th, Katrina is a Category 5. Mandatory evacuations are issued 30 hours in advance of the storm's landfall. The state fails, however, to coordinate with hospitals and nursing homes in New Orleans, causing hundreds to be left to die as the waters begin to rise, with no transportation that can take them. The ableism on display by the New Orleans city government, as well as the state and federal levels, is absurd. On August 29th, between 4.30 and 5.30 a.m., the levees along the 110 highway fail on both sides. The sandbags used to patch the non-functional sections of the barriers are destroyed by the nine-foot storm surge, before Katrina herself ever graces land. The Superdome loses power around the same time. 20,000 huddle in the dark as the sounds of hellish storms grow louder and louder. The rest of New Orleans loses power just an hour later. Katrina finally makes landfall as a Category 3 in Buras, LA at 6.10 a.m. Category 4 winds are reported in some places. The storm would tear the roof of the Superdome off, causing water to begin to leak in. On top of that, the Superdome's sewage systems would back up and fail. The dome, much like the levees, was not actually prepared for a storm this strong. While it was believed its roof could withstand wind speeds of 200 miles per hour, its official testing was never completed before the storm hit. Water entered the dome as holes formed in the roof. The smell became unbearable as late August heat cooked the inhabitants, along with the waste and feces that had no proper place to be disposed of. The lack of power meant little light, no refrigeration, and no air conditioning. Those with medical disabilities were supposed to be moved to the convention center, but the transportation fell apart. For six days, people in the Superdome languished, struggled, and begged for help. Some reported watching trucks full of supplies simply drive past them. FEMA at times seemingly arbitrarily withheld and slowed up supplies and manpower, refusing aid from Germany, sending volunteers from out of state to Atlanta for sexual harassment training rather than to New Orleans for search and rescue. Director Michael Brown ordered emergency responders such as firefighters and paramedics not to answer calls unless on his orders, blocked civilian volunteer aircraft from conducting rescues, sent doctors to mop floors to avoid legal liabilities, and worse. Walmart delivery trucks tried to bring water before the storm and were turned away, both then and when they returned to provide the same water. FEMA cut the Jefferson Parish emergency communications line, which had to be repaired and then guarded by the sheriff from FEMA. Quote, the U.S. Forest Service had water tanker aircraft available to help douse the fires raging on our riverfront, but FEMA has yet to accept the aid. When Amtrak offered trains to evacuate significant numbers of victims, far more efficiently than buses, FEMA again dragged its feet. Offers of medicine, communications equipment, and other desperately needed items continued to flow in, only to be ignored by the agency. But perhaps the greatest disappointment stands at the breached 17th Street levee. 
Touring this critical site yesterday with the president, I saw what I believe to be real and significant efforts to get a handle on a major cause of this catastrophe. Flying over this critical spot again this morning less than 24 hours later, it became apparent that yesterday we witnessed a hastily prepared stage set for a presidential photo opportunity, and the desperately needed resources we saw were this morning reduced to a single lonely piece of equipment. The good and decent people of Southeast Louisiana and the Gulf Coast, black and white, rich and poor, young and old, deserve far better from their national government. Senator Mary Landro. FEMA's failure was only partly this blatant cruelty, however. Much of the blame for how FEMA was set up to operate during the storm lies on Bush. Then God King of the hell state that is America, President Bush in the wake of 9-11 merged FEMA into the Department of Homeland Security. This caused the organization's focus to shift from natural disaster response to counterterrorism and response to terrorist attacks. Under Bush and Brown, FEMA neglected holding disaster response trainings and was under-budgeted and underprepared due to cuts. In the wake of Katrina, simply acquiring the money to do anything was a bureaucratic nightmare. Quote, Some emergency managers inside and outside of the government started sounding an alarm that still rings loudly. Bush administration policy changes and budget cuts, they say, are sapping FEMA's long-term ability to cushion the blow of hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, wildfires, and other natural disasters. Among emergency specialists, mitigation, the measures taken in advance to minimize the damage caused by natural disasters, is a crucial part of the strategy to save lives and cut recovery costs. But since 2001, key federal disaster mitigation programs developed over many years have been slashed and tossed aside. FEMA's Project Impact, a model mitigation system created by the Clinton administration, has been canceled outright. Federal funding of post-disaster mitigation efforts designed to protect people and property from the next disaster have been cut in half and now communities across the country must compete for pre-disaster mitigation dollars. As a result, some state and local emergency managers say it's become more difficult to get the equipment and funds they need to most effectively deal with disasters. In addition, the White House has pushed for privatization of essential government services, including disaster management, and merged FEMA into the Department of Homeland Security, where natural disaster programs are often sidelined for counter-terrorist programs. Along the way, morale at FEMA has plummeted, and many of the agency's most experienced personnel have left for work in other government agencies or private corporations. Over the past three and a half years, FEMA has gone from being a model agency to being one where funds are misspent, employee morale has fallen, and our nation's emergency management capability is being eroded. Our professional staff are being systematically replaced by politically connected novices and contractors. That was written in 2004. Bush's reorganization and defunding of FEMA and laser focus on counterterrorism in the early 2000s left FEMA completely unprepared for Katrina in terms of training, competence, supplies, manpower, and money. When they did manage to help, they still found ways to blunder on dangerously large scales. For example, FEMA supplied trailers full of toxic amounts of formaldehyde. Over 40% of the 12,000 trailers provided by FEMA were entirely unusable. Attempts to remove them sparked protests as people had literally nowhere else to go and would be left homeless due to FEMA's mistake. FEMA received 11,000 complaints by 2008 of health issues from these trailers. As recently as 2016, some were still living in them, and some had even been resold on the market despite the health risks. In addition, the focus on counterterrorism had also sapped the National Guard's strength. The National Guard, a vital source of manpower for rescue operations during natural disasters, was only capable of sending 5.3 thousand people, as nearly 50 thousand of the National Guard were on deployment in Iraq for some reason. Why was the National Guard on deployment in Iraq? On top of these failures, the treatment of the refugees themselves post-Katrina was nightmarish. Refugees who went to Gretna via the Crescent City Connection were turned away at gunpoint by sheriffs and GPD who fired guns over their heads and blocked the bridge. So riding down the street, you loot, we shoot. I was down the street and they said, where you from? Where you at? Turn around, turn around. I said, hold on, I live right here in the next block. Turn around, turn around. What about them lies, man? What about them people, man? What about them people, man? What about, what about this, man? What about... Excuse me, bro. Fuck. Then Vice President Dick Cheney ordered the Southern Pines Electric Power Association to stop working on restoring power to local hospitals and divert power crews to substations in nearby Collins, Mississippi, in order to secure the operation of the Colonial Pipeline, which carried gasoline and diesel fuel from Texas to the Northeast. 
At the Superdome, supplies are dwindling. People watch as water trucks drive past them without stopping, while the summer heat dehydrates them. There are almost no efforts to relocate refugees to adequate shelter being made. The Reliant Astrodome is fitted for 2,000 refugees and receives 5,000. FEMA slows the delivery of aid, trying to get control of the distributions, as well as fearing the deliveries will interfere with rescue operations. This fear is made less relevant as Blanco and Nagin, along with some cops and media officials, begin spreading salacious stories of violence in the Superdome and in New Orleans from looters. This fear-mongering causes more slowdowns and chaos in the response. Only six ever died in the Superdome, one from suicide, four from natural causes, but that doesn't stop the blatantly racist fear-mongering. Quote, they have people standing out there. They have been in that freaking Superdome for five days watching dead bodies, watching hooligans killing people. People. Nagin's hope was likely that these stories being spread would get more attention and thus more aid to New Orleans, but it only fueled the racism and paranoia that led people to turn away the needy at Gretna. Kathleen Blanco herself takes thousands of cops and National Guardsmen off relief efforts and has them focus on stopping looting and restoring order. The level at which the post-9-11 paranoia was dripping through every aspect of the response and relief effort is terrifying. Blanco said this as she gave the order that condemned the already desperate people of New Orleans to further desperation and abandonment. I have one message for these hoodlums. These troops are fresh back from Iraq, well-trained, experienced, battle-tested, and under my orders to restore order in the streets. They have M16s and they are locked and loaded. These troops know how to shoot and kill and they are more than willing to do so if necessary, and I expect they will." End quote. Mayor Nagin too ordered almost the entirety of New Orleans' police force to abandon the search and rescue missions in order to turn their attention toward controlling looting. Meanwhile, most people were simply taking what they needed and could to survive from already destroyed stores. But when whites did the same thing, it was not treated as a crime. The criminalization of people's state-sanctioned desperation as FEMA actively created conditions that made the situation worse, created an infuriating cycle where resources were directed to stop looting that was only taking place at all due to the misallocation of those same resources. Men who admitted looting, but said there was a reason. NOPD, the police, whatever y'all want to say, took our shoes, shoes and made a smell of in yes. his face it for no reason because no we were walking down the street. Talk about guns do, we have have guns. do we have a gun? Do I look like I have a gun on me? With no shirt on, no shoes. No shoes. We took our shoes. We put your face we down. We got us some new shoes. Don't so worry about that's that. why we got new ones. In real time, we watched the state create conditions that lead to desperation, then criminalize and demonize expressions of that exact desperation they caused. The incendiary and dramatic language used by Nagin, Blanco, and other officials caused an uptick in violence, particularly from police and white supremacist mobs, who both responded to the situation by murdering unarmed and innocent black citizens. The greater danger to black New Orleans citizens began more and more to be the systems around them and random racist violence than the storm itself ever was. On September 4th, one week after Katrina made landfall on the Danzinger Bridge, Officer Sergeant Kenneth Bowen, Sergeant Robert Jasevius, Officer Anthony Villavaso and Officer Robert Foucault shot six civilians, two of whom to death. One of the civilians killed was 17-year-old James Brissett. The other victims, four members of a family of five Brissett was with, were also shot. Three of the victims were teenagers, as well as one of the people the police shot at. The other man killed was Ronald Madison, a severely mentally and physically disabled man the police shot in the back. Quote, after the shootings, the officers immediately began to cover up what they had done, the Justice Department said. They arrested Madison's brother Lance and charged him with attempting to kill police officers. They submitted shell casings as evidence that hadn't been found at the scene and rehearsed their false statements together. The supervising officer Kaufman falsely testified that Lance had fired on his officers. He also fabricated witness statements to back up the officers' accounts. The four officers who fired the shots, Bowen, Jasevius, Falcone, and Villavaso, were ultimately convicted for the shootings and resulting cover-up. Kaufman, a supervisor, was sentenced for helping them hide what they had done. Five others pleaded guilty before the trial for participating in the conspiracy to cover up the crime. End quote. As of October 2020, all officers involved in the murder and maiming of civilians and the subsequent cover-up have been released from prison. While one-third of the police had abandoned the city, and another contingent seemed more concerned with maiming and murdering teenagers and families and covering up those murders, paranoid white militias began to form. 
In the neighborhood of Algiers Point, New Orleans, white militias killed at random and with impunity. Survivors of their violence recall them threatening black people at random with being shot, with lynchings and refusing to help black wounded people. At least 11 people were shot, though an exact number isn't known as records were not reliably kept. At least four people were murdered. At least four people were murdered. One participant in the racist and classist violence claimed the police gave them an essentially blank check to murder, telling people, quote, the police said, if they're breaking in your property, do what you gotta do and leave them on the side of the road. A former New Orleanian, this source spoke to me anonymously because she fears her relatives could be prosecuted for their crimes. My uncle was very excited that it was a free-for-all, white against black, that he could participate in, says the woman. For him, the opportunity to hunt black people was a joy. They didn't want any of the ghetto n****s coming over from the east side of the river, she says, adding that her relatives viewed African Americans who wandered into Algiers Point as fair game. One of her cousins, a young man in his 20s, sent an email to her and several other family members describing his adventures with the militia. He had attached a photo in which he posed next to an African American who'd been fatally shot. The tone of the email, she says, was gleeful. Her cousin was happy that they were shooting An Algiers Point homeowner who wasn't involved in the shootings describes another attack. All I can tell you is what I saw, says the white resident, who asked to remain anonymous for fear of reprisals. He witnessed a barrage of gunfire from a shotgun, an AK-47, and a handgun, directed by militiamen at two African-American men standing on Pelican Street, not too far from Janik's place. The gunfire hit one of them. I saw blood squirting out of his back. He says, I'm an EMT. My instinct should have been to rush to him, but I didn't. And if I had, those guys, the militiamen, might have opened up on me too. End quote. Scott Crow, author of the book Black Flags and Windmills, which is about these events, detailed his experience organizing alongside ex-Panther Malik Rahim and other former Black Panthers and anarchists from around the country to both provide relief and mutual aid on their own and to deal with the violence and intimidation meted out by white militias, coming together to form the Common Ground Collective. This organization still exists and at the point of its formation in Algiers Point, served as a basis for both community defense and mutual aid. Quote, These vigilantes were barely more than an organized lynch mob. From the backs of their trucks, they stated that, in the absence of the police, it was their job to secure order and law. The militias in Algiers Point seemed to be made up of drunken fools and racists from Algiers Point, a small, very wealthy white neighborhood that is about 10 blocks long in each direction. It is part of the broader West Bank, which is overwhelmingly black and poor. Algiers Point was the only neighborhood on the West Bank where traveling down the mostly abandoned streets, we saw signs like, you loot, we shoot, and your life ain't worth what's inside. Signs like these were put up by the vigilante types who stayed. It was as if the dam of civil society that kept them from acting out their most racist tendencies had broken enough to allow their hatred to emerge. This white militia, acting in the role of a paramilitary, rode around armed in low-income black communities and meted out intimidation from the backs of their trucks. What they called defense amounted to harassment of any unarmed black person on the street. They acted tough, never offering to help anyone but whites. I found myself asking, what kind of people are more interested in their private property and security than the well-being of another human? Scott Crow. Common Ground had multiple encounters with the militia, having to ward them off in some cases and exchange gunfire with them in others. Relying on volunteers from outside the community, and most importantly from within, as well as influxes of money and supplies from other organizations, Common Ground worked to provide what the state and what wealthier white New Orleans residents wouldn't and couldn't. Solidarity and aid. Common Ground provided basic medical care, cleaned up garbage, bodies, and health hazards from the communities to prevent the spread of diseases, worked to re-establish reliable communications in and out of New Orleans, and more. The organization was not merely in conflict with fascist militias, but also with the state. Police and the feds both aggressively questioned, surveilled, and harassed Common Ground's members, and in fact in January of that year, a founding member of the organization, Brandon Darby, would become COO and use his position to spy on the organization for the feds. The government also disrupted supply lines and hindered aid efforts, taking a highly aggressive stance against the organization. Quote, Within a week, Common Ground grew from a handful of individuals to almost 50 people divided between two centers. We were joined by more volunteers, including nurses and other health practitioners. They were gladly welcomed, but they were not enough to even just cover the immediate area. Supplies and people were still critically short. Many sick and elderly shut-ins had yet to be reached, and at least two unidentified dead bodies lay in the streets in Algiers. Then we were visited by two groups, the first of many to come, 
who were instrumental in providing vital material aid. The first was the Secours Populaire Française, a 50-year-old French aid organization that had been rebuffed by FEMA and the Red Cross. They stocked comprehensive medical supplies in our first aid clinic and provided the rest of the necessary hardware lists for the communication center, which was not yet fully operational. The second was Veterans for Peace. They had been put in charge of almost a million dollars raised by filmmaker Michael Moore on his website. The vets were all volunteers, many new to organizing. Moore had stipulated that they had to administer this money quickly and responsibly. Common Ground became one of their main beneficiaries. Without their vital support during this time, we might have collapsed from lack of supplies. They set up camp north of New Orleans in Slidell and began to run limited supplies into Algiers daily. We gave them lists of critical and non-critical items such as food, water, tarps, tools, fuel, and medical supplies. It was slow going at first, but VFP volunteers eventually traveled to far reaches to find us supplies. They even found us a small John boat for continued search and rescue both within New Orleans and in the outlying areas along the coast. In addition, we secured electrical generators to keep our operations going. Electricity was vital to keep radios, fans, and lights on on the hot days and nights. We also shared the power with residents. We would set up one in our backyard and run extension cords to multiple houses. Generators were the only sources of power for months in the 7th and 9th wards, as well as the coastal areas. Next to arrive was the Bay Area Radical Health Collective. They were worn out, but they were immediately jumped into the work at Tichy Street. They brought with them a wide variety of holistic health workers and our first official doctor. Our first aid station in the Masjid Bilal Mosque quickly became fully operational as the Common Ground Health Clinic. People started to flood the space. The clinic was staffed primarily by out-of-town volunteers, but a few residents who returned started to pitch in too. The mostly white street medics continued to put their lives on the line, defying police orders and combing the streets on foot and bicycle, even going into areas the police wouldn't go before the storm. In addition to the doctor, there were nurses, street medics, massage therapists, therapists, and herbalists on hand. We provided vital services to people with ongoing health issues who weren't getting their medications or hadn't been able to check in with a doctor for weeks. The clinic also provided a space for people to relieve their emotional traumas with the help of others who listened and cared. In short, we provided free holistic health care to communities on the West Bank who hadn't had access to it in years. This was a major accomplishment given where we were just days before. People wept from a mixture of trauma, anguish, and joy at the care they were given. Our goal was to perform a triage in order to take care of immediate needs, and in the long term, establish a permanent clinic. Each day, we were establishing strength, infrastructure for survival, and space for hope in these neighborhoods. In the years after Katrina, the city would be permanently changed. The pace of gentrification in New Orleans grew, as many black and low-income families either couldn't afford to come back or to go fix their homes. Communities became atomized, gang violence became more ubiquitous as traditional boundaries were annihilated, and enemies found each other on the same blocks. In 2016, one-third of the black residents of pre-Katrina New Orleans had not returned. New Orleans is still missing over half its population in some areas, and to this day, some are not fully rebuilt. The city still has 100,000 less people than before the storm. One million across the Gulf never returned. The only public hospital in New Orleans, the oldest in the country, was shut down. Of the 100,000 who never returned to the city, the vast majority are the former black residents of New Orleans. While the black population dropped by almost 90,000, the white population barely dropped by three. Katrina for the black population of the city mirrored the disaster of the St. Bernard flood for several reasons. The way entire communities, black communities, poor communities, were written off and made to be essentially non-citizens were not consulted in the political processes that determined their fate, not properly cared for after, and forced to leave and never return to places they once called home, are painfully familiar. Katrina is not just the story of government failure, but of a lack of care, a lack of responsibility, of neglect and therefore abandonment of New Orleans, and especially her black community. <laughs> The crisis that Katrina became was the result of a multitude of factors, partly the fault of ineffective and unclear leadership, and partly the fault of the state's blatant lack of desire to carry out basic duties, such as maintaining levees, communicating with hospitals, nursing homes, and the disabled in order to protect our most vulnerable, and failure to even order the use of the supplies that would have saved them. 
The further criminalization of the Katrina refugees and the resulting withholding of supplies due to looting itself also constitutes abandonment. Criminalizing people who are stealing, if we have to call them trying to survive in horrible conditions that, because you failed to organize a response and properly help these people, is immensely unfair and irresponsible, and it caused more violence and chaos than it prevented. Nearly 2,000 people died because the state couldn't be bothered to serve communities, stripped funds away from basic public works to fight terrorism, and then criminalized a population responding to the breakdown of the state and lack of resources. Ongoing in the era of climate collapse are these same habits, the ongoing abandonment of low-income communities and colonized communities to infrastructural breakdown and climate catastrophes can be seen in cases such as the Flint water crisis, where like New Orleans, the initial failure was caused by the state not being bothered to invest responsibly in the infrastructure that people depended on because they didn't want to spend the money. Once again, the result being death and sickness for low-income black households. In 2011, the city of Flint, Michigan faced economic strife in post-industrial neoliberal America. This caused the city to come under federal control, and Arnell Early was made the emergency response manager of the city of Flint. This essentially meant that he was the unelected mayor of the city, appointed by the governor to get things running in order. One of the first orders he gave to facilitate this was to stop pumping water to Flint from Lake Huron and the Detroit River, and to divert sourcing to the Flint River instead, the reasoning being that it was cheaper. It was already well known that the river was often a site of illegal dumping of waste from factories and other pollutants, but on top of this, the state failed to add corrosion inhibitors to the water flowing through the already old pipes. The corrosion caused lead to leak into the water and poisoned 100,000 residents. By 2014, they'd begun complaining to officials that the water had gone foul and it was making people sick, even going so far as to show up at City Hall with bottles of contaminated water visibly undrinkable. But it would take nearly two years before anything would be done. Instead, the emergency manager in 2015 would overturn the city council's vote to return to the old water system, and Mayor Dane Walling gaslights the population of his city as he drinks tap water, quote unquote, on live television. The state will come up with ways to gaslight you about how it's killing you faster than it comes up with solutions to the problem. Again, like the people of New Orleans, the people of Flint were left with little to no aid, no intervention from the EPA or the federal government, and had to organize on their own to deal with the issue. In early 2016, a coalition of citizens and groups, including Flint resident Melissa Mays, the local group Concerned Pastors for Social Action, NRDC, and the ACLU of Michigan, sued the city and the state's officials in order to secure safe drinking water for Flint residents. Among the demands of the suit, the proper testing and treatment of water for lead and the replacement of all the city's lead pipes. In March 2016, the coalition took additional action to address an urgent need, filing a motion to ensure that all residents, including children, the elderly, and others unable to reach the city's free water distribution centers would have access to safe drinking water through a bottled water delivery service or a robust filter installation and maintenance program. Those efforts were paid off. In November 2016, a federal judge sided with Flint residents and ordered the implementation of door-to-door -door delivery of bottled water to every home without a properly installed and maintained faucet filter. A more momentous win came the following March, with a major settlement requiring the city to replace the city's thousands of lead pipes with funding from the state and guaranteeing further funding for a comprehensive tap water testing a faucet filter installation and education program, free bottled water through the following summer, and continued health programs to help residents deal with the residual effects of Flint's tainted water. As of this year, most of the pipes in Flint have been replaced, with the city reaching 95% completion in September of 2023. Other sectors of the population don't simply experience these sudden situations of abandonment, but are constantly on the margins, constantly abandoned. Bringing back this quote, Thinking about organized abandonment should bring us to consider how capital, large and small, and the state, municipal or greater, work together to raise barriers to some kinds of people and lower them to others. Organized abandonment produces the experience of having been left out or forgotten. Unhoused people basically occupy a position of non-citizenship. Their inability to participate in capitalism in the most basic way renders them basically unhuman in the eyes of the state. They have no right to exist in most public spaces, in many cases, even when they have money to spend, it's not accepted simply because they're homeless and people don't even want to bother dealing with them, let alone treating them with basic respect. 
They are ignored by police and social services unless they are being harassed by them most of the time. 42% of unhoused people in the U.S. are disabled. They are a population that is rapidly aging, and older people with physical and mental disabilities, overwhelmingly Black, Indigenous, and Latine, are the most likely to end up homeless, a population that is 10 times more likely to be a victim of violent crime than the average American. Yet widely among the American populace, people treat the homeless like they are literally monsters. I got into an argument with some white gentrifier in the street once because he called a visibly disabled and elderly unhoused man lazy, and people looked at me like I was crazy for pointing out how ridiculous that assertion was coming from a clearly moneyed white tourist. The social attitudes we carry toward the unhoused can often themselves constitute a sort of abandonment. These people are seen as greedy, lazy, dirty, and ungrateful. Even as we refuse to make eye contact with them, and many view them and treat them as acceptable targets for random whims of violence and cruelty. The way Americans seem to leap at the opportunity to be cruel to people who have nothing is deeply disturbing. The state pulls resources that could help these people, and then uses them instead to make every public space so hostile to them that we can no longer inhabit them ourselves as non-unhoused people. Hostile architecture or anti-homeless architecture are small, sometimes seemingly mundane features that exist solely to prevent unhoused people from finding any sort of comfort in that space. Things like spikes under an underpass or humps on benches to deter rough sleepers, large planters or random geometric shapes like spheres take up entire sidewalks, or even things as seemingly innocuous as playing loud music in public spaces like train stations, just so unhoused people can't sleep there. Down my street, there was an awning in a public doorway that unhoused people sometimes slept under when it rained and they put a gate on it so they couldn't do that anymore. Quote, Hostile architecture not only punishes the homeless but other city residents as well, creating city spaces that are uncomfortable, unwelcoming, and inconvenient for everyone. Instead of relying on reactive strategies that negatively affect everyone, cities should instead solve the problem at the source by housing the homeless and making cities more accessible and community-oriented. While hostile architecture pushes away the homeless from wealthier and tourism-driven areas, Governments and planners euphemistically justify these acts as protecting public safety and increasing tourism and consumerism. Those designated as non-consumers are alienated from free public spaces through an uncomfortable and hostile environment. Hostile architecture doesn't solve homelessness, far from it. Instead of solving the socioeconomic roots of the problem, it just moves the homeless people out of sight. And from a moral standpoint, it seems wrong that governments are more focused on harassing and punishing those who need help rather than establishing the supportive programs needed to solve the problem. Through this mindset, homeless people are not treated as humans, but as public nuisances that must be removed from public spaces. The ideology of punishing vulnerable populations for issues often out of their control should not be the status quo. Because of our obsession with policing people who have nothing, less people can enjoy public spaces now. We have few public bathrooms, few places to sit, relax, and talk. Spending too much time not spending money in public gets you removed from spaces for loitering. Never mind how anti-loitering laws only existed to police black people pre-Jim Crow and serve as pretense to jail and commit black people to forced labor. Now those same laws shove black and brown poor people into the margins while removing the ability for any of us to socialize in public the way we used to without being policed, surveilled, and made to spend money. The abandonment of unhoused populations was a deliberate and systemic choice. People are allowed to die hungry on the street because the money that should be helping them now funds militarism and imperialism. The money that kept our libraries open is thrown back to us as tear gas after being taken away. Unhoused people are a population that is uniquely vulnerable to some of the most immediate deadly effects of climate change. During Katrina, the unhoused were among the populations left behind in the city, and with nowhere to go whatsoever, they were often the first to die. During the increasingly harsh winters and increasingly deadly heat waves of the summer, people without adequate shelter will be left exposed to conditions far outside what humans are capable of surviving, and the state only seems interested in making these people's lives more difficult. Homelessness is often an issue attributed to laziness, when in fact, it is much more accurate to blame it on systemic factors related to unregulated and unmitigated capitalism. But before we even discuss issues such as landlord and cartels artificially raising rents, Airbnb and its impacts on the housing market, we have to talk about the crisis of medical debt and healthcare access. Large shares of the insured working age adults surveyed said it was very or somewhat difficult to afford their healthcare. 43% of those with employer coverage, 57% with marketplace or individual market plans, 45% with Medicaid, and 51% with Medicare. 
Many insured adults said they or a family member had delayed or skipped needed healthcare or prescription drugs because they couldn't afford it in the past 12 months. 29% of those with employer coverage, 37% covered by marketplace or individual market plans, 39% 39 enrolled in Medicaid, and 42% with Medicare. Cost-driven delays in getting care or in missed care made people sicker. 54% of people with employer coverage who reported delaying or foregoing care because of costs said a health problem of theirs or a family member got worse because of it, as did 61% in marketplace or individual market plans, 60% with Medicaid, and 63% with Medicare. An inability to afford health care, and to be frank, a lack of competent and empathetic health care, especially for people of color who experience medical racism and are frequently neglected and abused by the medical system, can cause people to push medical issues and visits down the line. Expensive medications such as insulin and others can force people to ration their medical supplies or medicine, which is frequently deadly. Even when these struggles or delays don't kill people, they can disable either temporarily or permanently, which will affect people's ability to work and thus afford housing. This logic doesn't just extend it to physical disabilities, but mental ones as well. 30% of the unhoused have untreated mental health issues or disabilities as well. And that form of health going neglected can be just as debilitating as any physical disability. Beyond these kinds of economic factors are the cartel-like price schemes and monopolies being maintained by landlords across the nation. In November of this year, New York Representative Dan Goldman sent a letter requesting that the Attorney General's office investigate a company called RealPage Inc. and a so-called price optimization software called YieldStar. YieldStar's algorithm analyzes housing prices in an area to recommend sellers a price to offer for the property. These prices are inflated, though the company would describe what they're doing as maximizing output, or some other corporate speak that hides the cruelty of artificially inflating rents with an algorithm. After a merger that was approved by the DOJ in 2017 with one of their only large rivals gave them power over 3 million units in the country, RealPage had an effective monopoly on the business of offering price optimization, which is really just a nice way of saying price gouging. The software consolidates user data from a number of clients, meaning landlord companies, and consults those landlords on how they should price their properties. This allows property managers to coordinate their pricing and artificially inflate rents and therefore profits. In DC, where the software decides the rents of 50,000 units, a lawsuit is in place against 14 of the largest landlords in the area, who all use this software. In Seattle, 70% of over 9,000 surveyed homes were owned by just 10 landlords, all using the same software. In New York, where this software is being used by an unknown number of landlords, there has been a 22% increase in the rents of some areas since 2020. More than half of renters in New York spend 30% or more of their incomes on rent. Corporate landlords like BlackRock also buy up massive amounts of homes, sometimes entire neighborhoods, allowing them to monopolize entire communities and inflate prices of units, while also taking many off the market for families and people who could afford them. The unmitigated profiteering of the corporate landlords and their monopolies help to drive homelessness, and while the state lags to deal with these issues, it passes anti-homeless legislation 10 times as fast. For example, Bill AB257, introduced in Sacramento by Republican Josh Hoover. It makes it illegal for unhoused people to have encampments within 500 feet of schools, daycare centers, parks, and libraries. An absurd and unfair choice for the state that vastly underfunds social services while providing massive amounts of money for police to not help homeless people or facilitate getting them access to care in any way, but to just destroy their stuff and push the problem somewhere wealthy liberals don't have to see it. Unhoused people frequently have their medications, Documents such as citizenship and immigration papers, birth certificates, and IDs destroyed and thrown away, which perpetuates cycles of mental health struggles, physical health, and ability issues, and homelessness. The issue of homelessness is often blamed on a lack of available units, but in many places this isn't really the case. There isn't a lack of units, but a lack of affordable units, which means that effective tenants protections, stronger regulations, swifter antitrust and regulatory actions against large landlords and landlord cartels, as well as forcing landlords intentionally keeping units empty to collect application fees to sell them within a certain time period, would help to solve the problem. But in the meantime, while the state moves to quickly help the wealthy make money but lags badly in holding anyone accountable or solving the problem, most regular people are left alone to struggle. 62% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, which means that many of us, if not most, are one missed paycheck away from being unhoused ourselves, 
or at the very least, trapped in a cycle of late rents, meaning additional fees and continued lack of money that leads to more late rents and more fees and more of having nothing. Thinking about these as not simply policy failures, but often conscious choices to allow companies to commit unmitigated acts of greed and damage to the lives of the poorest among us and of minorities, and criminalizing those experiencing the effects of unmitigated capitalism, is ultimately an organized and conscious form of abandonment. One segment of the population is neglected and ignored and allowed to suffer damage, while another segment, the most wealthy segments of the in-group, are given blank checks by the state to extract and exploit from the poor. The job of police in this scenario is to complete the process of abandonment, locking people suffering from social ills and policy failures in jail, keeping them living on the margins, acting as the force of violence that disappears the abandoned from sight of the abandoneers. Going back to Ruth Wilson's writings on the subject, she doesn't necessarily just view organized abandonment as a condition, but an opportunity. The politicization of abandonment provides for people an opportunity to build community and organize to meet that need autonomously. We've seen this play out before, when the people of New Orleans were abandoned by a state that both consciously chose to not help them and failed to adequately prepare and aid when it did bother to. The people of New Orleans and those in solidarity around the country had to organize and respond on their own. Common Ground Collective worked together with people from all over the political spectrum to autonomously organize mutual aid and community anti-fascist defense from the Klan in Algiers Point, New Orleans. They used the tragedy of Katrina as a nexus point of organization and pulled community together to survive where they had been atomized and abandoned by state incompetence, abandonment, and disaster. People within the Superdome were left with almost nothing and languished for five days and thus had to organize among themselves. While the state dismissed them as looters, gangsters, murderers, and animals, those same people, some of them actual gang members who eschewed violence and united, worked together to help the disabled, to distribute food and supplies, and brave the elements and murderous cops and clansmen to gather more. People formed groups to stop sexual violence from occurring within the dome. People kept each other safe and advocated for each other. Quote, State workers told us off the record that we weren't supposed to exist. This area was supposed to be empty. It seemed that they wanted to starve out or remove the remaining residents. But our small-scale insurrection had disrupted their plans. People wanted to stay in their homes and face whatever was going to come their way. They had all heard stories from the Superdome and knew that friends and families were being shipped to unknown parts of the country. The government's agenda was simple. Clear the area of people by force or starvation. In a trickle at first, people started to come by to get supplies and basic first aid. Many people were wary of the mostly white volunteers in their neighborhoods, until they realized we were not FEMA or the Red Cross. Reggie and Reverend Powell, who were both Malik's neighbors, became some of the first ambassadors into these communities, going through the streets to let people know we were there. Some said they had seen us, but thought we were just more white vigilantes. Instead, they eventually found caring faces. I knew I was an invited outsider in these communities. I was always clear about this. Even though we were welcomed with open arms, I knew that only together could we work to make things better for everyone, but it was always going to be tenuous. I was working for the people of Algiers and New Orleans, and stated this in many of the early communiques. I was determined to use the privilege of my access to resources, people, materials, money, and media, to begin the process toward a forgotten kind of movement in the US. I wasn't kidding myself. We weren't like the Zapatistas, the Panthers, or the anarchists in Spain. But there were many comparisons to the groups that could be made in the ways we were going about our efforts. If you asked the residents there, there was little doubt that our small revolution was a spark of hope in those days. The COVID pandemic saw almost the exact same process take place that allowed Katrina to happen. Former President Trump gutted pandemic response teams in the years leading up to the virus. And similar to how FEMA was restructured and brought into the Department of Homeland Security, the pandemic response teams were not fully dismantled but the remaining parts were folded into other departments of the National Security Council. Counterterrorism. This gutting contributed to the absurdly incompetent in some places and intentionally lax in others pandemic response of 2020. During the COVID-19 pandemic, as the state flat out denied the crisis at first, then lagged to mitigate it and ultimately just gave up after dumping a measly $4,400 on some of the population, 
The result, like Katrina, was that disabled people, people of color, especially black and Filipino populations, the elderly and low-income people, were the worst impacted by a virus that was largely preventable. Most of the people who died from COVID, like most of those who died during Katrina, didn't have to die. With the state failing to respond, people had to. Rent relief funds sprung up autonomously, food deliveries were organized autonomously, mutual aid groups that formed during COVID kept people from going hungry. The disaster became a moment for autonomous organization and simultaneous politicization for a mass of people. That politicization would play a vital role in the radical politics that took place on the streets during the subsequent uprisings in 2020. Situations of organized abandonment created opportunities for radicalization and action that to this day still continue. So our task is to respond to the abandonment of our communities and people by doing our best to organize horizontally to meet the needs that crop up and add them to our struggles. Providing mutual aid, clothes, food, resources to the unhoused, and aiding them in navigating social systems to find housing, seizing empty buildings for them when possible, and meeting that need on our own. We need to engage in tenant organizing that can prevent people from becoming unhoused and push for more collectively owned housing. Organize to seize buildings and homes in neighborhoods back from slumlords and corporate landlords by whatever means available to us. We need to organize our workplaces, our schools, and prisons. We need to organize for undocumented agricultural workers who are marginalized and forgotten and kept in situations of desperation and non-citizenship to be more readily exploited. We need to provide mutual aid and support for those who provide mutual aid for migrants at the border and people fleeing for asylum who are abandoned and criminalized by the state, even though seeking asylum is legal, simply because the state would rather fuel and monetize the exploitation and violence that pushed them here rather than solve it. When the state and the police abandon us to racist and queerphobic fascist violence from militias and terrorists, we need to support anti-fascist community defense that can protect people and secure our right to exist safely. We need to work to connect these struggles and people working within different sectors of these struggles and treat every crisis as an opportunity to take back control and power for our communities by organizing where the state won't, can't, or is organized against us. When the political situation around us is one of abandonment, our politics must be one of anti-abandonment. Ours must be a politic of solidarity. Thank you for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you would like to support me as I make more content like this, you can go on Patreon and support me directly via the different tiers there. You get access to things like behind the scenes content, early access to videos, videos that are unreleased on the channel, scripts, um, writings that don't get turned into actual fully fledged videos, their short stories, whatever. So check that out if you want to support this channel directly. There are a lot of times where Patreon has been the only stable source of income that I have. So I really want to say thank you to everyone supporting the channel that way. And also through one-time donations on things like Venmo. Do me a favor and like and subscribe to this video. And especially if you don't mind, take the time to share this with a friend. Share it on whatever social media websites you use or whatever communities it's appropriate in. Or whoever you think it would be useful for. And thank you. Have a good one.